Hello and welcome to the first video on a series of three talks to mark World Bee Day 2022. This series comes from the All Ireland Pollinator Plan. And implementation of the plan is coordinated by the National Biodiversity Data Centre. The All Ireland Pollinator Plan is a framework bringing together farmers, councils, businesses, schools, communities and individuals across the island of Ireland to create a landscape where pollinators can survive and thrive. In this first video, I'm going to give you an introduction to Ireland's bees and why they're in trouble. My name is Una Fitzpatrick and I'm a senior ecologist in the National Biodiversity Data Centre and I'm also the chair and the project manager of the All Ireland Pollinator Plan. Ireland has amazing bee species. We've got 101 different species. We have the honeybee, then we have 21 bumblebees, and then we have 79 solitary bee species. So the honeybee is a managed pollinator. That's the one that's kept by beekeepers, and it's it's not in decline. But unfortunately, of these 100 wild bee species, one third are threatened with extinction from the island of Ireland. Bees are really important, as we all know. And the reason for that is that most insect pollination of our crops and our wild plants is carried out by bees. And the rest then is provided by the various other insects that visit flowers, particularly hoverflies and moths. And the reason why bees are so important within that insect mix is that bees feed their young only on pollen. So their whole life cycle is focused on visiting plants and collecting as much pollen as possible. We all know pollination is really important to us as humans. It's important for various different reasons. It's really important to the farmers and the growers who need pollinators to grow their pollinator dependent crops. And the free service provided by bees is worth up to 59 million a year in Ireland. It's important to us, you know, we wouldn't starve without pollinators, but it would be really hard to have a healthy balanced diet because it's mainly the fruits and vegetables that need to be pollinated. And the third one is, is critical and, and sometimes overlooked. Pollinators are an incredibly important part of our natural ecosystems. And 78% of our wild plants benefit from insect pollination. So if you've got more wild bees, you have more wild plants, they have more insects and vertebrates, fruits and seeds, which means more birds and mammals. So it really is true to say, you know, that wild plants sustain all other biodiversity, as well as providing carbon sequestration, flood mitigation, and not to mention the joy and the health benefits that we get from places where we can connect with nature. These are Ireland's 21 different bumblebee species. You can see gorgeous insects and an amazing range and diversity. I'm going to tell you firstly about the bumblebee's life cycle, and this is really important because it helps you to understand what they need, and also how easy it is to help them within the landscape. So with bumblebees, the queen emerges from hibernation in early spring. And for many people, it's a real sign that spring is finally here when you see these big queen bumblebees flying around again. So when the queen emerges, she feeds and she finds a nest. What she then does is she prepares a pollen loaf and a little wax pot that she fills with nectar. And then she starts laying eggs that she fertilizes with sperm stored from the previous year. Those female workers emerge and they take over the nest duties. The queen stays in the nest laying eggs. What happens then in mid to late summer is that the queen will lay some unfertilized eggs and they become males. And she'll also allow some new queens to develop. So she allows some of those female workers to develop into new queens. The new queens and the males leave the nest to find mates. The mated new queen then has to fatten up before hibernation and everyone else dies off. So the workers, the males and the old queen, they all die. The mated queen goes into hibernation and then the process starts again the following year. So you can see there that they need somewhere safe to make their nests. They need somewhere safe to hibernate. And really importantly, they need food right throughout their life cycle. So most of our bumblebees in Ireland nest on the surface of the ground or just underneath. So they really all they need are areas of undisturbed long grass. Things like the base of a hedgerow are absolutely perfect. To hibernate, they usually burrow in underground and they tend to choose the north facing slopes for that, just so that they don't get the winter sun and think it's spring too soon. The really important thing is that bumblebees need food sources right throughout the year. 
And I think more people are becoming aware of that and, and are really trying to help, but they tend to do it when they see bees and that tends to be in the you know late spring, summer. But we need to not forget about the other two ends of the life cycle. So in early spring, that's when the queens are establishing nests. And we know that that's the buff-tailed bumblebee, a really common bumblebee in Ireland. And we know that a queen buff-tailed bumblebee has to visit thousands of flowers every day just to get enough nectar to maintain the heat she needs to brood her first batch of eggs. So really important that there are early food sources in the landscape for them. And two critical ones are willow and dandelion. Then at the other end of the cycle in autumn, that's when the queens are fattening up for hibernation. And again, we know that the buff-tailed bumblebee, Bombus terrestris, she has to weigh at least 0 0.6 grams to successfully hibernates. Doesn't sound much to us, but that's a lot if you're a bumblebee. So really important that there's late flowering food sources in the landscape for them. And again, things like knapweed, ivy, really, really important. I'm going to show you a few of Ireland's bumblebees because they really are gorgeous insects. This is the early bumblebee, Bombus pratorum. This is Ireland's smallest bumblebee um, and it's a brilliant pollinator of soft fruits and at the minute in your garden if you've got things like raspberry or gooseberry or currants or blueberries you can be sure that there's a little tiny early bumblebee there busy pollinating them for you. This is the shrill carder bee, it's a Bombus sylvarum. Unfortunately this bumblebee is endangered in Ireland and it's called the shrill carder bee because they say it has a shriller buzz than the other species. And while it is endangered in Ireland, the burren does hold most of the remaining populations in Ireland and Britain at the minute. So really important that we try to protect that species into the future. This is the tree bumblebee, Bombus hypnorum. So this is our most recent bumblebee arrival. It was first spotted in Ireland in 2017. And this one's unlike all the others in the way it nests. So I mentioned before that all our other bumblebees nest on the surface of the ground or just underneath, but the tree bumblebee nests above ground in holes in trees or, or in bird boxes sometimes. So it's just arrived in Ireland, you can see there. Um, it arrived from Wales into, into the area around Dublin and also into Belfast, where it would have migrated across from Scotland. This is my favourite bumblebee. So this one's called the large carter bee or sometimes the moss carter bee, Bombus muscorum. And unfortunately, this one is vulnerable right across Europe. So it still occurs in Ireland, but it is declining. But the really important thing about this species is that we can rescue it. We really can by creating more habitat where it occurs. And within the All Ireland Pollinator Plan, we've been trying to make that happen. And there's some amazing initiatives by local communities who've really got behind this bee where they have it in their area and are taking action to try and protect it into the future. So I'm going to tell you about Ireland's solitary bees. So 79 different species this time. So again, an amazing diversity. I think most people are surprised when they see, you know, the range and extent of different species that we have. So there are two mason bees within the 79 solid trees. We also have five leaf cutter bees. We have the wool carder bee. There are four species of white faced bees, two species of sharp tailed bees, called sharp tailed bees because you can see the really sharp point to their abdomen there. We've got one flower bee. We've got 26 mining bees, 12 cuckoo bees five plaster bees, 13 sweat bees, seven blood bees, and then the violet carpenter bee. So 79 in total. Solitary bees have a simpler life cycle. So the males and the females emerge in spring. They meet, the female prepares a nest. She lays eggs and leaves a food supply of pollen. And most of our solitary bees are called mining bees, which means they make their nest by burrowing into bare soil. So they'll burrow in and make a wee tiny burrow. And within that, they'll have different cells. And in each cell, they'll leave a ball of food. So the female will collect a ball of food. It's like pollen mixed with nectar. So she'll leave a ball of food and then she'll lay a, a fertilized egg beside that ball of food and close up the cell. And then she'll do the same thing again, maybe eat 10 times. When she's happy she's done that, she'll close up the entire nest. The males and the females die the larvae will eat the food that the mum has left and then they'll overwinter as pupae to emerge again as adults next spring. So solitary bees need nest sites 
and they also need food sources. So where do solitary bees nest? Well, as I mentioned, most of our species are mining bees, so they nest in, in bare ground, usually south or east facing banks of bare soil. Um, really, really easy to create this. You know, all you need is a spade just to scrape back to, to create bare soil in, 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 the, in the right aspect. Other 15 species of solitary we have are called cavity nesters, and they nest in south or east facing cavities. So it could be cavities within loose masonry, stone walls, wooden structures, or the commercially available bee nest boxes. There are two types of bees that tend to use these um, bee nest boxes. Uh, one are the leaf cutter bees. You can see the photograph there. Leaf cutter bees cut pieces of leaf or petal and they bring it back to line the cells in the nest. And the other type of cavity nest and bee that commonly uses a, a bee nest box are the mason bees. I just want to show you a red mason bee nest progression. So someone sent me these amazing time series of photographs. He's a, he's a beekeeper actually, and by coincidence, the, the red mason bee had decided to make his nest with it within the hives. He was able to see it progressing and he sent me some photographs. I just want to show you what it looks like. So it's fascinating to see the way you know the nest develops. So this is the first photograph. So you can see here mason bees, unlike leaf cutters who line the cells with pieces of leaf or petal, the mason bees uh, make cells out of mud. So the female collects mud and brings it back and makes these cells. And you can see there within each cell, she's gone out and collected pollen and left a little food store in each. And it's different colours because pollen has been collected from different plant species. And on each, she lays a fertilised egg. They develop into the larvae. And the larvae will then eat that food source that the mother has left. And the pupae will then overwinter to emerge again as adults the next spring. So you can see it's amazing to think this is happening unbeknownst to most of us out there with all our little solitary bees. And the interesting thing about the red mason bee is that research has shown that just one female red mason bee can do the pollination work of hundreds of honeybees. And that's the thing about solitary bees. Often we don't notice them in the landscape, but they're incredibly important pollinators. And I just want to explain why they're so good. So honeybees and bumblebees they are brilliant at collecting pollen and bringing them as much back as possible to the nest to feed their young. And they've evolved to store the pollen on their back leg and they store it as a moist or a condensed pollen pellet. So they're able to bring lots back. Most solitary bees haven't quite evolved to do that. They do store the pollen on the back leg, but they store it as a loose or a dry pollen pellet. It's packed into the hairs on the leg. So you can see it there. You can imagine in that case, a lot more pollen gets dispersed around the flowers, which makes them obviously better pollinators. And then there's this other group of solitary bees and mason bees and the leaf cutter bees that I've mentioned. They haven't evolved to store the pollen on the back leg to return it to the nest. Instead, what they do is they pack it into the hairs on the underside of the abdomen. So you can imagine that's totally inefficient. The pollen goes everywhere. Fantastic for the plants because they're getting well pollinated, but the bee has to do lots more trips, which makes them, you know, funnily much more efficient and better pollinators. Again, I could tell you about all 79 solitary bee species, but I won't You'll be glad to hear. I'm just going to talk about a few of them. Um, this is the wool carder bee. So this species was first spotted in Ireland in 2015 in Wexford and has since been expanded its range in the southeast. And it's a lovely looking bee. You can see it's got these distinctive yellow markings down each side and, and yellow dots down the sides of the abdomen. And the female will carter bee scrapes hairs from leaves such as lamb's ear or woundwort, so any sort of hairy plant like that. And she scrapes them off and then cards them to use as a nest lining. This might be my favourite solitary bee. Um, it's called the gold fringed mason bee. And this little bee is a coastal species. So it only lives on, on sand dunes mainly. And it nests in empty snail shells. So it finds an empty snail shell and then makes, it, makes a nest by collecting bits of moss and that, that's where it will lay its eggs. The tawny minor bee, again, another gorgeous solitary bee species, really distinctive looking. Um, this 
saw the tree was extinct in Ireland for 87 years before it was rediscovered again in 2012, which is fantastic. And since then, it has been expanding its range in, in the southeast, which is fantastic to see. It's commonly found in gardens, the spring species. This is the salt bee that most people might spot when they first become aware of salt bees. It's called the grey or the ashy mining bee. Again, it's one of our most distinctive and commonly spotted in spring. You can see it has these really two clear grey bands of hair on the thorax there just behind the head. Last one I'm going to mention, but this is our newest solid bee arrival. So it arrived in Ireland for the first time really recently, just um, in March 2022, and spotted in Dublin city. It's called the hairy footed flower bee. Again, another fascinating insect. The males have these really hairy feet. You can see it on the, the picture there on the left. And the female looks completely different, you know, almost bumblebee like. So say this species was discovered by a local community group um, in Dublin. It'll be fantastic to see, you know, and hopefully see it expand its range in coming years. So you can see that we've got amazing bees and, and pollinators in Ireland, but unfortunately they're declining. And I think most people are very familiar with the reasons for this at the minute, but just to go through them. The main reason is habitat loss, you know, it's homelessness. Also a decline in wildflowers, which are hunger, pest and disease cause sickness, the use of pesticides, you know, which causes poisoning, and then climate change. And just to touch on climate change for a minute, because there's a couple of reasons why climate change is so difficult for bees and other insects. The first one is that you can get something called temporal mismatches, which means that the plants can flower before the bees emerge from hibernation, so there's no food source when they do. And the other thing is that the range a species can exist in can shift, but because their habitats are so fragmented, the bees can't move because it's too far for them to fly. So I suppose it kind of brings home how important it is that we make the whole landscape more pollinator friendly to give pollinators a fighting chance against climate change. If I had to look at all of the reasons why they're declining and pick the most important one, it is hunger. You know, there simply are not enough flowers in the landscape to support our wild pollinators anymore. Is, there is a lot that you can do to help. And the All Ireland Pollinator Plan was set up to do exactly this in, in 2015. It's a call to action to everyone. Everyone who has any responsibility for peace of land can help by making it more pollinator friendly. And together we can create an island where pollinators can survive and thrive. In the pollinator plan, we've been creating guidelines for different sectors. These show you simple evidence-based actions that you can take to provide food, shelter and safety, all freely available on the website, along with lots of other resources, including our top actions, which you're going to hear about in the second talk in this series. And it is true, you know, that lots of small actions taken together can begin to solve big problems. And to end, an enormous thank you to all those thousands of people who've already engaged with the All Ireland Pollinator Plan and are helping to create an island where pollinators can survive and thrive. And I hope that other people will get involved in the future. Thanks. <laughs>